In this exciting episode of the Perry Pod, a whistle-blowing priest gets murdered, and the most irritating nun Paul Drake Jr. has ever met gets fingered for it. How long has it been since you elicited your last confession, my son? It's episode 41 of the Perry Pod, the 1986 made-for-TV movie, The Case of the Notorious Nun. Welcome to the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy, and my purpose here is pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. I plan to do a pod for every episode of the television series, and in episodes like today's, I'll look at some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each episode, I give a brief refresher on the plot. If the episode was based on a novel, I compare the book with the television adaptation. I list some key pieces of trivia and tackle the episode's main theme, and then feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself. Then I finish with a post-case water cooler where just like Perry, Della, and Paul, or Paul Jr., we can rehash the ins and outs of their adventures. But first, to the law library! Each episode in the Law Library, we return to prior cases to refresh our memories about Perry's past so we can find fresh precedents for future cases. Last episode, in reviewing the case of the Rolling Bones, I mistakenly identified Charlie Barnaby, a.k.a. Country Boy Baker, the lover of Dolores Cotero, as Barnaby Jones? Roll that beautiful bean footage. It's probably the most wrenching lover speech we've heard since Dolores confessed to killing her vida, Barnaby Jones. Barnaby Jones. Starring Buddy Epson. Yep, Buddy Epson, P.I., is a far cry from con man L.Q. Jones. Barnaby Jones is a Quinn Martin production. Charlie Barnaby, more of an Aaron Spelling production, if you know what I mean. As we prepare to review the case of the notorious nun, we find that Perry in this made-for-TV movie, not only calls his client as a witness, but cracks the caper by putting on his own case. This is extremely rare, for Perry often wins through precise and rapier-sharp cross-examination. The only precedent in season one for this kind of thing, the case of the terrified typist, which as we discussed on that episode was already an outlier, also a case where he didn't win. Part of the appeal of this made-for-TV movie is that, unlike Perry Mason Returns, we get some serious courtroom time. Now, without further ado, let's get to the plot of our episode. The Case of the Notorious Nun Father Thomas O'Neill spends time in prayer, but the rest of his time is spent making enemies as he tries to clean up the corruption of a church-owned hospital located in... Well, I'm not really sure. It was filmed in Vancouver. Your guess is as good as mine. All we're sure of is that it's colder than Los Angeles. And you can bet that the enemies he's making are out to get him. Let's run through this rogues gallery. There's the church's attorney, Thomas Shea. Our firm has represented the church for over two decades, and I expect we'll be here long after he's gone. There's the unctuous Peter Lattimore, chief of medicine at the hospital. Doctor, how you treat your patients, that's your business. But how you run this hospital, that's mine. Look, Father O'Neill, you want something from me? Just ask me. I did, several times. Excuse us. 
Don't forget Ellen Cartwright, the hospital's administrator, and Lattimore's lover. Well, I couldn't get the accounts receivable you requested. Mrs. Cartwright, you're the administrator of this hospital. Can't you get me a simple piece of information? I'm sorry, but the computer went down. I'll have it in the next day or two. And this collection of ne'er-do-wells includes Jonathan Eastman, the church's accountant. I've been going over the Archdiocese books. How long has your firm been our accountants? Oh, nine years. O'Neill is aided in his quest to make the church right by the young and distinctly non-flying Sister Margaret, Father O'Neill's girl Friday who's on the cusp of taking her vows. As O'Neill gets closer to the truth, the accusations about him and Sister Margaret flying, you know what happens next. It appears Father O'Neill was stabbed sometime late last night. O'Neill is dead and Sister Margaret gets charged with his murder. Just like in Perry Mason Returns, we get to see the murderer an ersatz priest who goes by the name of Logan. But this only lets us know that someone must have hired him to commit the murder. Fortunately, the archbishop's best bud is Perry, who is so dedicated to finding church corruption that he fakes a health ailment? There's embezzlement in this hospital. Stephen asked me to help investigate Several of his close advisors may be involved. Your secret would have been very safe with me. Sorry for the deception, Della. For the moment, I uh, want to stay undercover. Once Perry gets back to health and takes on Sister Margaret's case, he quickly gets Paul Drake Jr. on the job. Paul Drake Jr., not too happy about it. What am I doing here, Della? Well, there's a case, and... A case? You've heard of Stephanie Harris, the most beautiful model in the history of California? Her father was paying me to accompany her to Tahiti. Now Howard Burton is in paradise and I am here on freezing. But if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And what would a little detective work be without looking through the garbage? When do they collect the trash? This is what detective work is all about. You're following the trail, finding the clues, and getting very dirty. Once Perry gets to court, he meets a prosecutor whose case he wants presided over. Remember, Perry was a judge before he stepped down to defend Della in Perry Mason Returns. Now he's got David Ogden Steers to go against. Mr. Mason, Michael Rustin. Possibly you remember I appeared before you in appellate court. But instead of ripping through witnesses on cross-examination, Mason waits until it's his turn to present his case. First up, Sister Margaret. Then I ask you for once and all time, did you or did you not murder Father Thomas O'Neill? No, sir, I did not. Then he's coming for you, Ellen Cartwright. Mrs. Cartwright, isn't it true that you and your partners are the sole owners of the Centurion Ambulance Service? I really don't see what the... Please, just answer the question. Yes, it's true. Oh, don't forget the unctuous Peter Lattimore. Isn't it true you received a phone call from someone who ordered you to the hospital to kill Paul Drake? Your Honor. Isn't it true that the person who called you knew you embezzled money from the hospital for your investments, including the Centurion Ambulance Service? Multiple and isn't it true that the person who called you ordered Logan Mr. Jefferson Mason to kill Father O'Neill? Mr. Mason! But in a fake out, it's not Dr. Lattimore who committed the crime. Nope. It's the guy we've really only seen once, Jonathan Eastman. He came from the East to do some accounting, cook the books, and arrange for the murder of a priest. Paul Jr. gives Sister Margaret his personal blessing before she heads off to the convent. Terrific. Terrific. Now, remember, you heard it here first. You are right. I am the most obstinate woman that you have ever met. Thank you. <laughs> 
Goodbye. Bye-bye. Notorious Nun No More! Happy days are here again. Now, let's get trivial, shall we? Each episode in our trivia section, I give you three takeaways. A Paul is a subject worth investigating more. A Della is something about a particular character in the story. And a Perry is something we learn about our main character. Our Paul! This episode concerns Tom Bosley, who appears in the movie briefly as Father De Leon, a Sister Margaret confidant. Good morning, Father. Well, how's it going with Father O'Neill? Are you keeping up with him? You may already know that beginning in 1989, Bosley starred as Father Dowling in the Father Dowling Mysteries, where Bosley played a Chicago-based priest who solved murders. What you may not know is that Fred Silverman and Joel Steiger, the men behind the case of the notorious nun, were also behind the Bosley series. That's right, it's something like a Perry spin-off. Our Paul prompt this week. Did any Perry regulars or guest stars appear on this Catholic priest coon detective series? Ardella, this episode concerns Father Tom O'Neill, played by... Timothy Bottoms. By 1986, Bottoms' time as an up-and-coming actor had long passed. He had cut his Hollywood teeth in three memorable movies, Johnny Got His Gun, The Last Picture Show, and The Paper Chase, all made between the years 1971 and 1973. But after that, Bottoms was in a host of movies that frankly don't ring a bell with me. There's Roller Coaster, The Other Side of the Mountain, Part 2, Hurricane, Tin Man, Hambone and Hilly, The Census Taker, and What Waits Below. After he appeared in The Case of the Notorious Nun, which surprisingly does not merit a mention in Bottoms' wiki page, he appeared in Texasville, the sequel to The Last Picture Show and as George Bush in the short-lived Trey Parker, Matt Stone political parody, That's My Bush! I, for one, think he's pretty convincing as a truth-telling priest who won't break his vows. Maybe she could consider revisiting The Collar? Perhaps a reboot of the Father Dowling series, The Father O'Neill Mysteries? Our period this episode involves our intrepid hero's health. We first meet him faking a heart ailment so as to gain illicit entrance to the corrupt church-owned hospital. When Dr. Lattimore asks him later about his quick recovery, Perry has this to say. Your recuperative powers are amazing. It runs in the family. Ah, Mason must come from a family of actors. The theme for this movie is keeping the faith. We open in a church with Father Tom seeking spiritual guidance and sustenance for the hard work he has to do. And oh, it would be great if everyone else would take their connection with the church as a signal to keep the faith rather than a license to make some easy money. All of this leads us to Sister Margaret, who isn't sure she can actually take her vows. Thankfully, she's got Paul Drake Jr. there as a confessor to have a heart-to-heart with her. I've never admitted this to anyone before. But I was attracted to Father O'Neill. And I tried not to be. And I couldn't help myself. I, I couldn't control myself, Paul. And I don't know if I'm fit to be a nun. Margaret. You're a human being. You you have feelings for... Like everybody else. And Peary is there by her side as well as she undergoes her crucible. She must confess her love for Father O'Neill while denying any wrongdoing. I loved Father O'Neill.
And you had an affair? No. The whole getting married to Jesus part of the nun's vows never really comes up, and the church's specific spiritual directives are kept implicit. But Perry's long been on the side of truth, and now we see he's on the side of the church, too. Way to keep the faith, Perry. Now it's time for a Perry proverb. <laughs> In Perry Mason Returns, the key dynamic was Perry's wavering trust in Paul Drake Jr. In the case of the notorious nun, Paul Jr. once again comes through for Perry, and Perry punctuates this final exchange with his former partner's son with this short but sweet proverb. Well, let's see, I've been half frozen, I've been shot, missed my trip to Tahiti, and what do I get? Thanks. Perry has always been good at saying a lot with a little. Notice how often the camera just focuses on Burr's eyes without Burr having to say a word. This closer from Perry is no different. I like to think that Perry isn't going to kick in any more cash than he has to, but Della looks on like a proud mama, and the trio leave the courtroom laughing with one another. Thank you, Perry, for closing another case successfully. Now, let's grab a swig from the water cooler. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. A research prompt from the last episode involved book-writing pop psychologists. John Searcy and Myra Carraway put forward two potential models for the ineffectual Dr. Norris. There's Dr. Spock, the guru of child psychology, and Joyce Brothers, talk show mainstay. Dr. Spock's 1946 book, the Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care sold over 50 million copies in its first 50 years of publication. You may also know that Spock ran afoul of the law, just like Dr. Norris in the 1960s when he counseled, aided, and abetted those who were dodging the draft. Critics like Norman Vincent Peale said that Spock's anti-war inclinations were in keeping with his instant gratification child-rearing recommendations. Spock denied the permissive label the critics tried to hang on him. His child-rearing techniques are certainly not the standard now, but used bookstores are sure to have a 5th or 6th or 7th edition of baby and child care hanging around if you want to see how the dude's policies hold up. A fun little note, Spock won an Olympic gold medal in 1924 as part of Yale's rowing team. Dr. Joyce Brothers reached national notoriety by winning the game show The $64,000 Question in 1957, where she parlayed her skill at answering boxing questions into then providing commentary for a 1958 Sugar Ray Robinson fight. She wrote a good housekeeping column for 40 years and was responsible for popularizing many psychological concepts. She appeared on the Johnny Carson Show over 90 times and was widely regarded as the face of popular psychology. Well, I don't know if Dr. Norris has the chops to sell 50 million books or smoke his pipe on a late night talk show while he opines about Arcus Sinilis. But a psychologist can dream, can't he? Thanks to my dad and Aunt Mai for those suggestions. As always, I'd love feedback about this particular episode or the podcast in general. Was there something you'd like to comment on or something you'd like to correct? You can leave comments on the pod's website at theperrypod.libsyn.com or email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find those links in the show notes. All Perry Pod episodes are available via Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Next time, we begin Season 2 and meet Joan Camden, a.k.a. Donna Knox, from the case of the Rolling Bones all over again. This time, 
as a defendant? It's the case of the corresponding corpse. Join me, won't you? Until then, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, keep on walking that Park Avenue beats.